peep shakes when he needs to or she needs to confront somebody. And, you know, I've always thought, because that I get the same way, the more practice, the better. And just know that if in the moment you can't contain yourself and you find yourself too nervous to talk or you're shaking, first of all, that's okay if you shake and don't think that that's a problem. And secondly, don't think that it's a problem to have some notes with you. If you have something that you know you need to say to somebody, you can do it on your time frame. You don't need to do it on anybody else's time frame. So what I recommend more than anything else is doing it when you're ready to do it and bringing some notes with you, you know, bringing a flashcard with you and reading it and telling them at the beginning, this might be a little bit difficult for me. So I'm going to be using some notes here and I'd like to be able to speak uninterrupted until I'm finished. All right. And set some ground rules right at the beginning. So I hope that that helps. And more than anything else, time and keep doing it, even though it's difficult. And just make sure to do it on your time frame in your way. You don't need to do it on anybody else's, uh, using anybody else's rules. All right. Let's see. Where are we? And then we had, ah, Vanessa, Vanessa Monroe had a question where she was asking how to set boundaries, especially with relatives who then accuse her of trying to change the world. <laughs> Vanessa, if that's happening to you, I, I always believe that scripting is the key. So I would, again, recommend that you script out whatever it is that you want to say and let people know if they, for example, tell you that you're trying to change the world or if they poo-poo your idea in any way, just use the that may be but and the broken record. Just repeat yourself. Keep saying what you need to say and confirm that they got the message. You know, if you were say to them something, for example, like, uh, I can't. I can't talk to you if you're going to be name calling, for example. And they say, oh, you're just trying to change the world. Well, that may be, but we can no longer talk until you stop the name calling. Is that understood? Do you understand? So get the confirmation before you finish and stick to your boundaries and to your consequences. If you give people consequences, you know, I'm a big believer in the desk script. The desk script is very simple and I don't think people use it enough. It's D E S C. Describe the situation give the effects of what's going on, say what it is that you want, and then see, add some consequences. So tell people, for example, if it's my aunt, Jesse, Jesse, yesterday when you called me a name, it made me so upset that I withdrew and couldn't enjoy the, the dinner anymore. In the future, if you call me a name in public like that, I'm going to have to refrain from coming to any of your events. Are we on the same page? Have I made myself clear? Do you understand what I'm saying? And then stick to that, you know, but just have the D-E-S-C. Here's what you did. Here's why that's wrong. Here's what I'd like you to do in the future. And here's what will happen if you can do that. Okay. So I think that will really help. Scripting always helps because we don't tend to communicate in a clear manner. Hey, Heather, if we don't have a script. All right. So you are early. <laughs> okay. Thanks for holding the session. What is the best way to handle the situation when your boss has taken your idea and positioned it as their own in a team meeting? You know, it's funny, Don, I just talked about that one. And I have to say, when I have found myself in a situation like that, I let it go because I figure, well, that's what I'm paid for, I guess, in a way, you know, not just one moment. Not 100%, but I do tend to let that type of thing go. But I would talk to my boss about that. So gather your thoughts, use a script and ask your boss if that's part of the deal. You know, if, if when you come up with an idea, if he or she is going to claim that as his own or her own, because I would tell them that it caught you off guard uh, and you want to maybe just reevaluate the situation, because if that's what they're going to do in public right in front of you, I'm sure that they're doing that in private as well. Uh, so I don't know exactly if, if, if that's the response that you're looking for, <laughs> but that's what I would do. Generally, under normal circumstances, I would let it go until I'm the boss. And then I'd steal everyone else's idea. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> I would I would wait until I'm in that position so that I could show people the way it's really done and give people the credit that they're due. Um, Don, how to diffuse tension when colleagues are arguing at a meeting? Should I even attempt to step in? Well, Don, I have to say, meetings are one of the things that causes people the most some of the most grief in, in the office because it tends to be, for a lot of us, a waste of time, confusing. And if there were a clear set of meeting rules to begin with, we shouldn't have any of these challenges. So what I recommend more than anything else is to speak to whomever it is that's in charge of these meetings and tell them, hey, you know, I believe that we could get much more out of these meetings if we had a clear set of rules. 
there was a guide that I used to use called the Little Black Book of Meeting Rules. And in that book, they had a very simple set of rules that people, oh, thank you. Uh, they had a the situation when your boss is taking, great, thank, thank you, by the way. I, was, I, I apologize, this is new for me and I'm getting some notes from my uh, partner, Michelle. Uh, if you use the little black book of meeting rules, for example, I'm sure that there's been an updated version. In fact, I'm gonna look that up. Let me write that down. Uh, little black book. If there's a, a clear set of rules such as, here's the agenda, here are the people who are invited and who are not invited. For example, we tend to invite the whole department every time and there's no really reason to do that unless people are going to be contributing, if they have something to contribute, if they're gonna be affected by what's said maybe. But I would start off, for example, with an agenda and an invite list and time frames, you know, how much you can talk, when you're done, you pass the baton or whatever it may be. And when you have a set of rules and you stick to it, we shouldn't have that type of chaos to begin with. But uh, you had asked specifically how to diffuse the tension. You know what I have done, Don, and people really liked it. And I didn't think a whole lot of it at the time. Now, looking back on it, I think, how could I have, how could I have done that? But when that type of thing would start in a meeting, I would say in the meeting, well, excuse me, excuse me. I don't believe I have anything constructive to contribute to this. So I'm going to go back to my desk. And if anyone needs anything, you know where to find me. Okay. And people would be like, okay. And then people would get the hint. As soon as this stuff starts, I'm not contributing to it. You all evidently don't have any rules that you play by. So I'm out of here. I have work to do. So you might want to try that. If, if it's not constructive, excuse yourself and leave. And then you don't have to worry about the tension because you're not going to be a part of it. Um, hey, Heather. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, okay, Jennifer. Hi, Dad. Hi, Jennifer. Um, thank you. Thank you, Heather. And okay, Jennifer M. What do you do about gossip behind your back? Do you confront the individuals or let it slide? Okay. If, oh, excuse me, Heather. That's my sister-in-law, Michelle, by the way. Um, if somebody I find out is gossiping about me at work, I have always tended to take the same approach to it and it works well for me. And that is, first of all, I, you have to ask yourself, how are you finding out about this gossip? Is somebody else coming to you and telling you, hey, you know, Mary's talking about you? If so, I would recommend that you recognize that the person who brings this to you normally is truly the gossiper because we all have different ways of working through issues or expressing ourselves. And under normal circumstances, if somebody comes to me and is telling me that someone else is gossiping about me, I would want to tell that person Okay, Trixie, you know, if the person who's coming to me is Trixie, before you continue, I want you to know I will be discussing this with Michelle and the person who under normal circumstances will be labeled the gossip will be you because whatever Trixie said about me wasn't meant for my ears to begin with. So I don't know why you're bringing this to me, but I just want to lay down that groundwork before you continue. Are you sure you want to continue? And whatever you say, remember that when you're telling a gossiper or somebody who's bringing you news from other people that they said about you, give them the opportunity to stop and either continue or not continue. And if they choose, by the way, to say, you know, something along the lines of, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, I won't say anymore. Then I would not repeat it to the other person. You know, Trixie was going to gossip about me, or about you with me. But I would always give people the opportunity when you recognize what they're doing to stop. And if they do stop, forgive them for that. But that's number one. I would ask yourself, who's bringing this to me and recognize that they are the true gossip? Because maybe that person who was talking with them about you was simply working through something. And under normal circumstances, I would rather that somebody's working through something about me without me, if, they, if it could be. And if you have worked through it and said what you needed to say and realized, you know, that's ridiculous and I wasn't really putting this into perspective and you didn't bring it to me, then I would think, okay, you worked through it. You're good. Because unless you bring it to me, it's not about me. If you're talking with somebody else about me, that's generally not for my ears. And if, however, you know, I find out that somebody just won't stop <laughs> talking about me and I thought they were my friend, I would just take that knowledge because it's always going to benefit me knowing that that's how you are. Telling you that I know that isn't going to benefit me. It might actually not benefit me. You know, it might be a negative. So I wouldn't, under normal, normal circumstances, do anything unless the person is telling my secrets to other people, then I might stop and tell them, you know, using a desk script even, you know, hey, Trixie, 
I heard that yesterday you said that. And when you say things like that about me, it tarnishes my reputation. It it makes me less likely to be able to confide in you in the future. So in the future, can I trust you to keep our personal business personal? Keep it simple is the big thing because we all do that. Anybody who says that they don't talk about other people generally isn't really being honest with themselves or other people because we all kind of do that. We have relationships and are in relationship with other people and we need to work through that in different ways. So sometimes it's better for me not to talk to you about an issue I may have with you. It might be better to talk to somebody else. That doesn't mean I'm gossiping. Um, okay, have <laughs> the dreaded drama triangle. I have not heard about the dreaded drama triangle, but we should talk about it together, Heather. It's time. And Rhonda Reeves. Hi, Rhonda. Okay, what do you do about gossip? We talked about that one. Um, okay, when, okay, after many years of trying, this is from, oh, hi, Laura, you remember. Hey, Mar hey, Laura. L Laura, Laura on. I have no idea how to pronounce that. I apologize. But nice to have a member here. After many years of trying, I've had to have very limited contact with my sister. That's too bad. How do I explain that to another family member who starts asking questions about it? Love your content. Thanks, you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Well, let me think about that one for a moment. If So, for example, I've decided not to talk to my aunt because I, I only have one brother. So let's say I decided not to talk to my aunt anymore. And Marty, my brother, asks me, hey, why don't you talk to Aunt Sharon anymore? Sharon, I would never do that to you, by the way. I think I would be honest in the sense that I'm guessing that the reason you don't talk to your sister anymore is because it's just too difficult for you, or you would. So I think I would take the approach of, you know, trying to, I'm thinking about this, how can I say it in a loving way? How can I be honest, yet loving, yet not spill the beans and talk about my Aunt Sharon with my brother? I might simply say something like, Mart, it's too difficult for me to talk to her in a loving way, so I'm choosing at this moment not to talk to her any more than I need to. I hope you can understand that. And I don't want to, let's say, reveal what it was about. Uh, I don't I don't want to say anything negative about her. That relationship right now is just something that I can't manage or I'm choosing not to deal with. So I would be honest without revealing too many details. And I would probably throw in there, as is probably the case with you, that it's because at this point you don't know how or you're not prepared to or you're not equipped to deal with her in a loving way that you both deserve. And so you just can't right now. I mean, guess, I'm guessing that that is the case. That tends to be the case. Um, right? Good question, Laura. Um, so I hope that that helps. But I am guessing that the reason you're asking it is because you have not yet addressed that with other family members. So putting those, putting the little that I know about this together, that's the answer that I would give you is just to tell them quickly and succinctly, I'm not equipped to deal with this in a loving way right now, so I'm not dealing with this. By the way, or so I'm so I'm going to so I'm going to refrain from engaging in that relationship for now. Uh, I got a question yesterday. Somebody asked, "How can I tell a family member I don't want to deal with you because, or or how can I explain to the other family members why I'm not dealing with her? Let's say that it's my, um, I'm going to say again, my aunt Sharon. You can take it, Sharon. So let's say that." My cousin Kathy says, hey, I can't deal with my Aunt Sharon because of the way that she talks. And it's not necessarily to her, although it is to her, but if you have somebody in your life, a family member, a friend, part of your circle that everybody likes, everybody loves, but you can't deal with the way they behave, not necessarily directed towards you, but you just can't deal with it. What I told this person to say was, it's difficult for me to process the way so-and-so communicates. It's difficult for me to process the way Sharon communicates for whatever reason. Maybe it's because of my background. Maybe it's because of a, an incident that I had when I was younger. But for whatever reason, you might even say this to the person if they ever say, what's the deal? Why don't you ever call me anymore? Well, to be frank with you, it's difficult for me to process the way that you communicate with other people. And I didn't know how to tell you that. So I'm telling it to you now. But that's honest and it's not blaming and it's not... Uh, saying anything negative about that person, but that's generally the case when we think about it. I can't process the way you communicate. And that's usually enough for most people. Um, 
You were on my training videos for employer two years ago. Was I? Oh, cool. So Sergio, Sergio says I was I was on my training videos for an employer. Cool. Tell me which employer. I'm grateful. I <laughs> that would that would be good to know so that I could send them something. I don't know. Uh Sharon used to be so <laughs> <laughs> My brother's now commenting. It's Sh Aunt Sharon, if you are watching this, that uh, that is amazing. I th again, I used your name because I figured you could take it because you are so lovely that you know that it's not true. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Somebody is saying, okay, how do you handle being told by your supervisors that you give off the energy of not being approachable in the workplace, especially if you're a new manager? Great question. So FISA is asking, let's say that your manager comes to you and says, hey, I've gotten some feedback about you, and it's that you're not very approachable. People will have trouble, maybe you're intimidating or you don't, you just don't seem approachable. Remember to ask, and this was just in my video last week, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, what questions rather than why questions. The reason that I say that is because when we ask, and I have found this out recently, by the way, this is something new, excuse me, this is something new for me. When we ask people why, why would you say that? Why do people have a problem with me? Why questions evidently create too much work for our brain. And furthermore, they're not as specific as what questions. You know, if you were to ask me, why do you behave that way? Or why, why do you say that? Well, I could say, well, because when I was a child, I was traumatized. <laughs> and uh, because of that trauma, it's carried over until today. And when I meet people like you who speak the way that you do, it reminds me of that. Why questions are way too vague. A what question, oops, excuse me, a what question would be, I think, more to your benefit, FISA. Something along the lines of, could you tell me exactly what it is that I do that is causing people to feel put off by me? Could you because if 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 they're telling you that, there's a reason behind it. And it's going to be a benefit to you if you can grasp whatever it is that they're saying and make it work for you. So I would ask whoever's telling you that, could you please tell me what it is that I could do? to make people feel as though they can approach me more easily. Could you tell me what it is maybe that I'm doing that is putting people off and try to do that? So I would take the feedback that they're giving you and just really be insistent that they give you something more than that. Because if somebody, and you might want to explain to them in a non-confrontational way, you know, Charlie, the challenge that I have, here's here's what I might say if I if somebody came up to me and told me, Dan, people find you a little unapproachable, and I wanted you to know that. And I'm sitting there simmering about this for, you know, <laughs> days, day after day after day, thinking, oh, my gosh, I thought I was so approachable, and come to find out I'm not. I might go back to that person and say, you know, Charlie, the other day when you gave me that feedback, I'm grateful for it. So thank you for that. However, I've been trying to figure out what it is that I'm doing. Could you please give me some specific feedback as to what it is and what it is that I might be able to do differently so that people would feel as though I'm more approachable? And if they say, oh, no, I just wanted to give you that feedback, but I can't tell you anymore, I would clarify to them, well, unfortunately, that 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 type of feedback, it's not useful to me because I don't know what to do or I would do it. Is there anything that you could maybe do, like go back to the person? Because they probably won't reveal to you who said that. Could you go back to the person and ask them and maybe come back to me? Because I want to be better and I want to change, but... I don't know what it is that I can do and any help that you could give me, I would appreciate it. Another thing that you might want to do, by the way, Faiza, let me find something for you uh, because I have something on, oh, shout out. Hey, hey, Terry Dow, by the way. Hey, Terry Dow. Thank you for being here, Terry. Uh, I have a personal survey. I'm going, to, I'm going to see where it is on the website. Hold on one second, because this is something that I recommend sending out to your peers. And I've done this and it makes a huge difference. It's difficult to hear, but you get used to it. Once you've done it once or twice, you'll be like, oh, you know, <laughs> rolls right off of me. But it is a, I'll, you know what I will do? I will put this in the comments at the end. I'm going to go look up where I have this personal survey and I will put it in the chat section because you can copy it and send it out to people. And it just asks pretty basic communica communication questions like, can you tell me how easy I am to work with? How competent do you find me to be? Uh, how am I with gossip and things like that? But getting that type of feedback from your peers is just, it, it really puts you into a whole different category of 
professional, you know, a professional who is so dedicated to growth that they're willing to reach out to their fellow employees and ask them even in an anonymous way to rate them and tell them what they could do better, what they could improve on, things like that. So if you send that out to everybody, even if you don't get any more specific information from the person who told you that or from the person who originally said it, you will probably find out what you're looking for. Uh, so I would recommend that. And you just go around asking people, hey, can I send you a survey? And you send it to them and they can fill it out, answer it anonymously, and then you get all of this great feedback. And then, by the way, just so you know, when it comes time for your review or when it comes time to maybe apply for a better job in that company, if it is, you can use that as a reference and say, for example, six months ago, I had my peers fill out this survey and here's the results that I got. And then two weeks ago, I had them fill it out again. So you can see the growth. You can see in black and white the progress that I've made, the improvements that I have made. And it helps when you are looking to ask for more money or for promotion or things like that. Or when you're going to a new job. I would use that, by the way, in conjunction with your value journal, which helps you document what are the things that you bring to the table that are above and beyond uh, what you already paid for. So those two things I'm going to put in the chat. Okay, I think you'll find that very handy, and I apologize for going off on that. Okay. Um, okay, when your boss... Okay, we talked about that one, Don. So how to diffuse the situation when colleagues... We talked about that one. Okay. Hey, T, Therese, and Jennifer M. Okay. Um, in your opinion, when is a workplace too toxic to tolerate? Heather, that's a good one. Okay. When is a workplace too toxic to tolerate? Boy, that's a good one because everybody, I think, knows what it's like to work in a toxic workplace. I mean, if you've worked in more than one place, chances are at least one of them was toxic. I don't, you know what, Heather? Um, I don't know when, when some places, I think you have to trust your instinct because when I'm in a place that's too toxic, first of all, here's what, here's how I'll answer that, Heather. Heather's question is how do you know when a place is too toxic to tolerate? You know, when you're saying, I got to get out of here. First of all, I think when you're going into any organization, we have to assume that there are going to be situations and people that are going to try us and be tests for us and where we are in our development. So I think that we need to go in prepared, having our uh, daily affirmations ready, having done our personal compass, really knowing who we are walking into that position. If we do that, if we have done our homework, if we have our tools, we have our visual cues, our reminders, we have prepared ourselves for it, we tend not to notice so much the toxic behavior that's going on or the toxic people that are there. And so it shouldn't really bother us that much. We shouldn't really let it affect us. We shouldn't notice it. That said, I realize that sometimes you can't help it because it is so overwhelming or you are absolutely forced to deal with certain individuals that are going to do things to try and sabotage you and make your life more difficult. So I, I think if you come, to, here's, here's, I'm thinking what I would judge it by. If I'm at a point where instead of growing and becoming a better person, for whatever reason, I'm doing the opposite and I find myself transforming to that environment, because I believe we are always either going to be transforming our environment or conforming to it. And one of the ways, by the way, that we can transform our environment is just to set an example. I don't need to go in and tell everybody what to do or what I do that helps me get through the day. If I can just be the person that I'm supposed to be and set that example, I believe that that's the best way to teach by example. And so people will see that and some people will then come and ask you questions. Some people will just try and emulate your behavior. If you find the opposite happening though, and instead of that happening, I'm becoming toxic and I'm not growing. I think that's where I would want to, for my own benefit, change my environment because for whatever reason, I, it's not working for me here. My magic wand is broken. And I would reflect on that, and then in my next position or wherever I'm going, be aware of that, that that last position, you know, I have, we have a lot of personal challenges and battles that we face in our life. I would want to recognize I did not win that battle. You know, I, I did not have the proper tools. I wasn't prepared for it. So I'm going to try and prepare for it in the future because it will happen again. If we leave a toxic environment, yeah, this is the biggest thing. If we leave a toxic environment and quit, before having worked through whatever it is that it was supposed to be teaching us, 
I at least want to be prepared and know that that is going to keep happening again and again and again and again until I work through whatever it is that it's bringing to my attention because that's the way the universe works. So I can't just fire you or quit or divorce you or break up with you or end the relationship simply because I don't want to work through what it's bringing up. I have to at least be aware of what that is so that I can work through it or it's just going to keep coming up over and over and over and over again. And that's miserable. <laughs> okay. One second here. Hi, Rhonda. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure I'm getting everybody. Hey, Jennifer. I see your kapow. <laughs> okay, Vanessa. When I talk to my son, he just gets stressed out and upset with a new baby on the way. I need some strategies for how to handle her. I'm just getting confused with the genders. Okay. When I talk to my son, he just gets stressed out and upset with a new baby on the way. I think he probably meant to say him, right? Or he meant to say my daughter. I'm just going to guess that. I need some strategies for how to handle her. <sighs> okay, Vanessa Lilly. I'm not... This, that, that is not my area of expertise. That said, what I think is probably going on is your son or your daughter is feeling like their place is going to be like when my nephew Eamon came along, I was always the baby of the family. We have a, I have a lot of cousins and a lot of uh, family, but my, in my family, there's just the two of us, my brother and me, and I'm the younger of the two, much, much younger. And he, well, I'm 10 months younger than my brother. And I was always of the entire family, the baby. And so that's a position I held. And then my brother and his wife selfishly decided to have a baby. And when he was on the way, I remember thinking, how, <laughs> oh, I got another one. Lily. Uh, yep. Oh, very past. Okay. Thank you for the other question, by the way. Uh, I remember thinking how... I remember how strange that felt, that all of a sudden I wasn't going to be the baby anymore. And it threw me off. And there are pictures that I'm going to try to post one of these pictures. Hold on a minute. There are pictures of me the day Eamon was born, my nephew Eamon. And <laughs> I looked like I was a zombie. And I remember feeling that way the whole day. I remember feeling like this is unreal. Something's very strange here because all of a sudden now I was not going to be the youngest and I was being, and I was in my, I think, 30s by the time he came along. And that was a strange experience for me. So what I'm thinking is your son or your daughter who's, who you're having trouble with, I bet is feeling the same way. Include them and ask them how they feel about it and talk through it with them and their role with the new baby. I think even though that is not my forte, talking with people about how they feel is always going to be the key to getting them to work through however it is that they feel if they're not expressing it in a healthy way help them express it and they will eventually be healthy. So, okay. When I talked to my son, he's like, oh, that was it. Um, my daughter-in-law is very passive aggressive towards me. She's all about her family and leaves my husband and me out of it as much as she can. <sighs> okay. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking about the people with whom I've had that type of relationship where they just... Here's what I'm thinking. Okay, Vanessa. When your when your daughter-in-law is talking about her family and leaves your husband and you out of it as much as she can, I'm guessing this. Okay, this is the vibe I'm I'm receiving from the universe. <laughs> I'm guessing that you and your husband and your son are very tight and probably have a Oh, there's buddy. Probably have a good life. Oh, geez. Hold on. I apologize. Hold on. Go, by. Go, by. Go bark at the garden. Gardening time. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I apologize. I'm guessing that your family is tight and has a pretty good thing going. And that your daughter-in-law doesn't really believe that her family does. I'm guessing that she spends more time at your house than at her house. And what she's trying to do is validate her own her own family because you guys think you're so great you know that's what i'm thinking that she's probably thinking oh they think they're so great or it's so difficult to compete with them and so she's trying to she's trying to say probably in her own way hey i have a good 
family too, even though it's not really visible here. Maybe she feels guilty that I'm guessing maybe did she move away from them? And then now she's more with your family than her own. So here's my thoughts. It tends to be that if we are acting in, if we're acting up and we're making other people feel bad, it's because we feel bad. And I, I've actually come to believe something that I did not believe in the past. And that is that there is either love or fear. And when we are acting out in a way that it sounds like your daughter-in-law is acting, that's coming from fear. And it's probably that she is afraid that her own family is getting left behind. She's afraid that her family maybe wasn't, now that she sees yours, maybe wasn't as great as she thought it was. Maybe she's afraid that whatever it may be, I'm guessing that it's out of fear that she does that. And so I would try to be compassionate with that and just listen to her. And I wouldn't do anything because I have never found a way to change that if it's a forced way. You know, to, I've never found a way to say anything or bring people around to my way of thinking unless it's I'm just loving to them and they eventually figure it out and stop being so afraid that simply because I'm not validating their existence that it's not valid. So validate her existence and her family and maybe she would stop that. Um, okay, I know we have to go. Oh, oh it's, it's 6.30. I know we have to go. Okay, uh, so that's... Seven, okay. Yep. Okay. We are going to be back next week at this time. Uh, how old are you and how old is he? My brother. Oh, shut up, <laughs> Marty. <laughs> I work in an open office. But okay, Michaela, this is our last question. Michaela, hi. Um, I work in an open office environment and constantly interrupted. How do I politely tell them to leave me alone so I can do my job? Oh, Michaela. I love to use the uh, availability monitor. Remember, in situations like that, I think I have found physical tools to help us remind other people that you are busy and that you can't just stop every five minutes. First of all, I would, okay, I would, I'm going to try to summarize this as quickly as I can because I know people are waiting on me to stop. I would try to educate people as quickly as possible, send out a flyer, give people a quick little talk, talk about it during lunch, about the true price of being interrupted constantly, even if it's a minute here and a minute there, about how our brain has to work up to actually being focused on something. I think it takes like 30 minutes. And then if we are interrupted, it takes us like 30 minutes to get back into that same wavelength, literally. And if we are interrupted, let's say once an hour, that means we are never going to be at maximum potential when it comes to our brain waves and focus. And we will be as unfocused or more unfocused as if we are smoking pot. I, I read that, not that there's anything wrong with smoking pot, but there's a reason why we shouldn't sit around smoking pot at work because it would affect our capacity. And we would be better off smoking pot at work than having interruptions is what I learned one day. So tell people that and use something physical that says it could be something that hangs on your wall that has like a, a little sign that goes one red, one side is red and one side is green, available, not available. Have that up there. And if somebody comes, that's, a, that's called an availability monitor. If somebody comes in and tries to interrupt you, do not answer them. You know, tap on that thing, reminding them I'm not available right now. Don't look up. Don't give them your attention so that people get it. Because if we keep letting people interrupt us, remember what gets rewarded gets repeated. So if you have not found the right tool, try an availability monitor. If you Google it, it's somewhere in my blog. I will try to add that. By the way, let me put that on there. I'll add a link to a, the availability monitor. And I hope that that helps. And there's a, I do a, uh, I did a blog on that and I think a video on that once. So I will try to find that and post it again. Thank you everybody. But higher writing is if you need, if you need a uh, resume or if you're searching for a job, remember go to higherwriting.com. Is it? Or email Heather, Heather at higherwriting.com. I'm not exactly sure how to spell the higher egg. I can't remember off the top of my head, but thank you, Michaela. And uh, <laughs> the dreaded drama triangle next week. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everybody. I will see you soon. And remember that, please, until I see you next time, if you're with people, I hope they're people that you love. And I hope that you speak loving words to them because there's nothing you have to say that you can't say in a loving way. So thank you all. Goodbye.